Good evening. Good to have you here tonight. Uh, oh, I had my mic coming apart there. Um, I'm Pastor Tom Rako. We're glad you're here. We have quite a number of people that have also joined us online. I know we have a Bible study group in Nebraska that are watching tonight. And uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, I know we got Shirley Nemec, Wayne Elsleben, uh, Allison Nemec, uh, Mike Knapper, Christy Rice, uh, Stephanie Jakes. Chris, um, uh, there we have the, the Kleins there in, in Nebraska with their study groups. Well, we're glad you're, you've uh, joined us. And uh, let us know that you're online. We have quite a, quite a number of them. And you'll also have a chance to ask questions both here and you can uh, uh, just Put them on your on the Facebook, and we'll read them off. And uh, so, 
If you want to know how to do like a, your own personal appendectomy uh, without going to the doctor, or <laughs> they call it rustic appendectomy today, I guess, or something like that. Um, but it is kind of interesting that uh, we, we have the Barons that will be uh, doing a song and then we'll go jump right into the presentation. Uh, that the medical aspects of the crucifixion that Dr. John Burton Singh will be sharing. But uh, they had a daughter who, uh, an emergency appendectomy, correct? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we had, uh, have a daughter, uh, emergency appendectomy, mercy. And so uh, everybody here has somebody that, uh, <laughs> that and we, I know we have, uh, we have uh, a health worker that has now step taking a bigger step into uh, homeschooling, right? Yeah. And uh, but also it works with Dr. Bernstein. Uh, any other medical people here that we want to recognize? But we got a few people here. I know we have a, we have uh, quite a few people online. And so as we begin, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And like I said, uh, after Dr. Bernstein's uh, presentation, then we will have a time for questions as well. Want to thank. Uh, uh, Paul Nickel uh, upstairs. My wife kind of got it started up tonight, and uh, Paul will be running the camera, so we appreciate that. Let's go ahead and uh, have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your grace that was demonstrated, your love was demonstrated for us. When we think of Good Friday, we think of you sending your son into the world that we might live through him, through his death, we might live. And of course, we know that he was raised from the dead. But even as we get some of those details, as we peer into some of the medical aspects, as Dr. Bernsing leads us and shows us and guides us, Lord, I pray that each one here, each one watching, will have just a greater appreciation of how much they are loved by you, Jesus. Lord, we need you. We pray for those that are struggling in some way. I know uh, right now in other parts of the world, there's great upheaval. Even uh, today in Washington, we think of the family of this slain officer and also the perpetrator, their family. We pray for your grace. I know our daughter on her way to the airport saw a body, that there was an accident. We think of that family. All these things, we are so fragile and frail but you have given us great hope through what you did at Calvary, and so we thank you. We pray for your blessing upon this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna go ahead and begin, and then I'll give a slight introduction to Dr. Bernsing after this special selection.
Thank you, Barron's family. We really appreciate it. Beautiful. And uh, we are glad that those who have joined us online are able to do so. And as I pointed out, we will have a time for questions. Our, our daughter, Mercy, who's uh, an occupational therapist in Kansas, she said, and, and Dr. Bernsing operated on her, she said she's really pumped to, to <laughs> hear this. So, and I, Dr. John Bernsing is a retired general uh, surgeon, correct? And he's board certified, uh, has quite a story. He's married to Pat. They have uh, two grown children, Ryan and Marissa. And uh, we are really glad to have him here. He's also president of the local Gideon's camp. I will tell you just a personal thing that really means a lot to us. Um, oh, probably a year ago, I shared, uh, I think maybe with you and Wayne, a mm -hmm. family situation and that they would pray for. Mm -hmm. And about six months later, I'm going into the Walmart bathroom, the one way back, and Dr. Bernsing is coming out, and uh, he asked about that. And um, it was really meaningful. When I told my wife, she started crying. Mm -hmm. And so he's, a, he's a, a faithful man, a man who loves the Lord. And uh, we had him here before we had either of these additions. I think actually uh, Helen Peel was the instigator who's going to be with the Lord, and her son, uh, uh, Gary is here tonight, and um, we, I, I just was really moved by it. We were going to have it last year, but because of the pandemic, we couldn't, but he is here tonight. And so let's give him a warm welcome as he comes. So, uh, thank you, thank you. Well, I'm glad to be here. This is, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this is, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to share this story. Um, as a physician, it's, it was always kind of interesting to me, the story of the crucifixion and how does a person die, what do they go through, and it's uh, pretty remarkable and striking. It was uh, just a terrible way of, of punishing a, a someone. So we're going to jump right in. And when I say this is a, the arts and science of crucifixion, you're going to see some scenes from uh, paintings that have been done over the centuries and then also uh, some scenes from the movie, The Passion of Christ. So Martin Luther King Jr. wrote this, this is his quote, you can't get to Easter Sunday, but through Good Friday. Christ has to go, he has to be killed. And that's the only way our sins were gonna be forgiven. Uh, Cornelius Tacitus was a, a, a Roman historian. Interesting history, though. He was a uh, Roman general and uh, retired and became a historian. And he wrote this, that the founder of this name, Christ, had been executed in the reign of Tiberius, who was the Caesar of the time, by the procur procurator Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judah. And this is from uh, Josephus. He was a Jewish historian, and he wrote this in 90 A.D., Around this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed it is right to call him a man, for he was a worker of amazing deeds and was a teacher of people who accept the truth with pleasure. He won over both many Jews and many Greeks. He was the Messiah. Pilate, when he heard him accused by the leading man among us, condemned him to the cross. But those who at first loved him did not cease doing so, for on the third day he appeared to them alive again because of the divine prophets had prophesied this and a myriad of other things around him. And to this day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not disappeared. So this is a map, you really can't see much on it, but it's present day Israel and uh, um, Again, I apologize for the, it's not quite as big as I'd like to have it, but Israel, and in the middle of that is Jerusalem, uh, where his crucifixion occurred, and higher up, you can see the little lake above there, that's the Sea of Galilee, and that's uh, the, uh, the, the province of uh, Galilee, and where he, in, which included Nazareth. This is a picture of the temple, and, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this little marker is going to work there, but it's the, the, 
the, that's Jerusalem city in blue, and that little uh, trapezoid or that rectangular thing in the right upper quadrant, that is uh, the temple. And then right above it, there's this little thing to the left, and that's the fortress of uh, Antonio, which is where uh, Pilate was a resident. This is a drawing uh, of that same thing. And these arrows, I don't know how well you can see that, but it draws out the passage that, whoop, that Jesus took. Let me go back here. Sorry about that. The, in the left lower quadrant there, I'm talking physician talk, quadrants. <laughs> Uh, is the upper room. And right above that uh, thing in the left lower quadrant, there's another little mark there, and that was Caiaphas' uh, residence, and that's where he had one of his trials before going to the fortress of Antonio. But these little aerials show the passage that the disciples took down through that southeastern gate and then up through the valley of Kidron to the Garden of Gethsemane. And then from there, when Judas did the betrayal, they marched him back, the temple guard did, through the doors. They first went to Annas' residence, which again is described in the Bible. And he was the ex-high priest and also the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And from there, from Annas, they went down to Caiaphas' residence and then up to the uh, temple where the Sandredin, Sanhedrin pronounced the guilty verdict on him. And then he was brought to Pilate's Residence, that little uh, box on top there again. And so it just kind of gives you an idea, biblically, the passages of where he went. So death by crucifixion was not new at the time. It actually started back in the ninth century. The Assyrian Empire, their first drawings they could see archaeologically of, uh, of, uh, of this type of punishment Usually it was crucifixion, they would just nail people up on a tree. Then the fifth century BC, uh, the Persians started doing it. And then there are some records from 330 BC in Macedonia. And then Alexander the Great began using the, crucif the crucifixion process. And then uh, it went to Egypt and, the, and to Carthage after that. And then the Romans, when they invaded and took over, the Romans learned from the Carthaginians how to do it, and then they perfected the, uh, the treatment. So they did not, the Romans did not invent it, but they perfected it as a form of torture and capital punishment. It was designed to produce a slow death at, with the maximum amount of pain. It was one of the most uh, disgraceful uh, and uh, cruel methods of execution. It was often a form of public service just for the Romans to let them know this is not good. If, you, if you're being crucified, it's not good. But interesting, a Roman citizen could not, could not be executed. It was usually reserved for insurrectionists, slaves, and other people that, uh, uh, people coming into the area that weren't Roman citizens. Uh, just one little fact, women, if they were crucified in, the Ro in those Roman days, they would, instead of being out on the cross like this, they would be turned onto the cross. So their, their bare fronts would not be exposed. Uh, I thought that was kind of an interesting side note. Whoops. Um, so the, the crucifixion process, uh, had to, the, the, the permission had to come from the governing Romans. And that's why, that's why the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, they had to bring Jesus to the Roman governor to get him crucified. So the Fortress Antonio was the residence on the governmental seat of Pontius Pilate. And again, procurator means governor of Judea. And what they had to get him, being a blasphemer, which means to say, I am, the, I am God or I am the son of God, the Romans didn't care about that. He had to do something worse than that. He had to claim himself to be the king or he had to claim himself to be an insurrectionist or try to take down the Roman government. So <clears throat> the self-appointed king who had undermined Roman activity is what the Jewish Sanhedrin used 
to get him crucified. Uh, Cicero, an old, uh, a writer from way back in those days, said it's the most cruel and horrifying of all deaths. Tacitus, who was that, that Roman historian, said it was a despicable death. Uh, John MacArthur, in his research, had found that there were some Bible scholars had seen up to a 300 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in this one man, Jesus. Here is a painting uh, back from, uh, I can't remember, it doesn't have a date on it, but this is, again, it's all started Palm Sunday with Jesus coming in on the colt into Jerusalem. And at the time, they were waving palm branches, they were laying down their coats in the streets, welcoming. This is a, a pretty small, I don't know if you can read all this, but this is kind of a timeline. Uh, so when, when the disciples left the upper room and got to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, they feel that that was about one o'clock in the morning. And the betrayal of Judas, they think, happened about 30 minutes into that time period. And then there was this irregular, unauthorized inquiry around two o'clock, and that was at the uh, Annas' residence. He was the ex-high priest. And then they went over to Caiaphas's residence around three o'clock. And then the formal trial before the Sanhedrin at, at the, uh, the temple, that was at 6 a.m. And that's when the Jewish day starts, is at 6 a.m. Uh, for the, uh, the first interrogation of Pilate around 6.30, and then the mockery before Herod. Herod Antipas was the governor of Galilee, and he had come down for the, the, the Passover festival and so forth. And so he had his own little um, cal or palace, and he, uh, Jesus, Jesus was sent to him. Remember, Pilate finds no guilt in him, and so he sends him to Herod, and Herod tries to question, but Jesus doesn't say anything at that point in time. And then he goes back, back to Pilate. Again, further on the timeline, at 7.30, uh, it's the Gospels describe this is about the, fi the, the final uh, judgment of Pilate. The scourging would take place in the Praetorium, which was kind of like the courtyard in front of that fortress of Antonio. And uh, uh, that was always a precursor to the crucifixion. And we're going to learn about that further. The nailing of the hands and the feet to the cross around 9 a.m., and as you remember, the Bible talks about darkness fell across the area around noon, and then Jesus dies at three o'clock, or the ninth hour. And it's interesting uh, that in the Passover celebration, which was gonna be Saturday, the killing of the, the sacrificial lamb is at three o'clock the day before. And I thought that was just a symbolic, just fascinating thing, that Jesus dies the exact time that the lamb would be, caught, would be sacrificed. And this is a real busy slide. <clears throat> but the, it's designed to tell you that every one of these little encounters were all illegal. All this stuff was illegal. When uh, there's been historians that have gone back and looked at what were the standard processes for getting someone accused of a crime or whatever. Well, this was all stuff that was going on secretly during the night. And uh, eventually, it started off, in, as you mentioned, in Annas's, and then Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. All the stuff was done illegally. There's a condition called hematohydrosis, and, and I, I think you've probably seen this in the scripture where it says, Jesus sweat drops of blood. And that's actually a real condition. It's very, very rare. There's, there's not a whole lot of... Uh, documented cases, except there are, they are out there, and it's kind of amazing. Um, this is just a painting from 1400s of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's demonstrating there the sweat of the blood. So it's a rare medical condition in which the human being sweats blood. It may occur when the patient is a person, the patient, when the person is suffering, is suffering just extreme levels of anxiety and stress. Uh, especially in fear of their own death. Uh, the severe mental anxiety activates what's called our sympathetic nervous system and evokes this uh, stress reaction to such a degree 
that these little tiny capillaries that go alongside each sweat gland just get so, the hypertension gets so intense that they just burst, and then blood just leaks out with the sweat. There's been several historical references. Uh, I can, think you can see it there, are cases of people that were going into battle, or people that feared they're, they were gonna be killed, women who had feared being, were at, the, uh, at a at point in their, in their lives or a situation they may have been raped. <clears throat> this is just a painting of Jesus being betrayed by Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Roman uh, temple, gu or the, uh, temple guards uh, taking him. Here's uh, uh, from the movie The Passion of Christ, and here's uh, Jesus after he'd been uh, taken uh, from Annas' residence to Caiaphas, the high priest's residence, and uh, accused of being a blasphemer meaning someone who says he was God. And then after he goes from this Caiaphas residence to Sanhedrin, they have their trial. The Sanhedrin is made up of about 70 leaders, Jewish leaders, and uh, they, make, made, they made the decision to convict him of being a blasphemer. So he's brought over to Pilate at the Fortress Antonio, and here's again from the movie where Jesus is being accused of being a blasphemer. The problem is, is that that doesn't do anything for the Romans. They could care less whether he says he's God or not. They had multiple gods. They had many, many gods. So it didn't make any difference to them. So he sends him over to Herod of Antipas, and he asks him and questions him and so forth, but Jesus doesn't respond. He doesn't say anything at that point. So he just throws up his hands, you can see there, and sends him back to Pilate. Here's a painting from uh, uh, 1820 or so, and this shows Pilate reaching out in the crowd saying, what do I accuse this man of? And um, if you remember, I can't remember which, which gospel it is, but Pilate's wife has this dream that says, this man is innocent, and you need to let him go. And you can see she's the woman on the right facing away. So the crucifixion process uh, involves a scourging. But before the scourging, he had to get this guilty verdict. And so what they decided then was to do is he calls himself the king, and he's going to take over the Roman government. And that was the only thing that, G that uh, Pilate could get by with sending this guy to be crucified. And so he was willing to do that just to satisfy the crowds and to satisfy the Jewish leaders. But the other thing was he had an escape there. He says that because of the celebration, I will let one of the prisoners go. And we have four, we'll only crucify three. So he gave them, the, op the people, the option, who can we, I will let Barabbas go, who was an insurrectionist, who had killed people, who had who was willing, he was somebody certainly ready to be and should have been crucified during, in that law, but they gave him the option, the people said, no, crucify Jesus. So he went from the fortress of Antonio into that uh, uh, praetorium in front, and that's where the scourging would occur. So what that is, is kind of a legal preliminary to any Roman execution. And that involved kind of a wooden stick about this long, and it had these leather ties that would come off. And then each in one of those ties would have metal, pieces of metal and bone that were woven in, or they're stuck into that leather, and then the person would be flogged. So they would be tied to a post, stripped of their clothing, and there would be two legionnaires. Legionnaires made, made up a, a group, there was a hundred of them that uh, were part of the crucifixion process, and then they were led by a centurion who was kind of the person in charge. So they'd be stripped of their clothing to this upright post, and they, uh, there would be one here and one here, and then there'd be a righty, and there'd be someone, well, the lefty, coming across this way. So you'll see a, a, a drawing here of, of the type of injuries. Here's just a, a painting of, of uh, Jesus being tied up to the wooden post. <clears throat> you can see on the drawing on the right 
how uh, they would get those types of uh, lacerations and uh, uh, injuries. The type of injuries you're gonna see in the next picture here are kind of interesting because these bones and metal would literally rip through the skin. And so the, the types of injuries were both partial thickness lacerations and, and full thickness lacerations. So there'd be quite a bit of bleeding and uh, actually down to the muscle. Here's, here's uh, from the movie, uh, Jesus tied to the stipes, it's called uh, uh, the post, and then uh, one of the legionnaires doing the flogging. And I, I don't think we can blow that up, but you can see uh, the, the movie just did an amazing job of trying to demonstrate these full thickness and partial thickness lacerations, as you can see on, on Jesus back there. So this would, uh, there's some record that the Romans would give 39 lashes, and, uh, uh, but other literature says that could vary. So we don't know how many lashes he got, but the, again, the idea was it would take the person, weaken them, and uh, of course, humiliate them in the process. So this is, he's untied from the, uh, uh, the wooden post. And then these other legionnaires attach this uh, crown of thorns to him because his, his crime is being king of the Jews. And uh, uh, so they attach this uh, thorn thing and they're doing it with sticks because these, these uh, thorns are about two to three and a half inches long. Um, and they would, of course, the scalp is, is deep, and so, but it's, the scalp is very vascular. And so there, once that was shoved into his, I can't imagine how the pain just with that would cause all kinds of discomfort. And then they uh, covered him with a uh, robe, a royal robe, a purple robe, and which is another interesting thing. Uh, the purple, purple was a very rare color. Matter of fact, uh, there was an article I was reading not too long ago where the color came from an oyster, an actual oyster. And so it was a very rare thing to be able to get that color to use to, to, to color their clothing. So it was, purple was usually only used for royalty. And he was, as the Bible describes, he was given a purple robe temporarily. And then Pilate, uh, uh, the thing he's holding, this thing is called a titulus, and that would, they would, put down what the, uh, the crime was, for it was king of the Jews, that's what it says on top. Uh, and, uh, and then they would put in in two or three languages, whoever was, lived in that area, um, they would describe th their name and then what their crime was, so that if you were Hebrew, you were a Gentile, Aramaic, or whatever the language was, Latin, you would understand who this person was and what their crime was. So the, the crucifixion process uh, going further on was customary for the condemned to carry their own cross uh, from the flogging post in the praetorium to the site of the crucifixion outside the walls. The crucifixion was never done inside the city. It was always done on the outside. Uh, the person was usually naked, but not always. It depended on the customs of the area. And uh, uh, usually the person only carried the crossbar. And you'll see in the movie, uh, they, they illustrate both. Uh, but usually, the, because the crossbar was so heavy, it's 75 to 125 pounds, just that alone. It had been very difficult to carry the upright part as well. They would carry it across, they'd tie it to the nape of the neck, and they would... Uh, walk to the outside of the city to the, uh, the area of crucifixion. I think uh, in, the, in the Catholic faith, I think they, it was at Via Della Rosa, I think, is the path that Jesus took, took through Jerusalem to get to the outside and to the area. Uh, the profession, professional to the, uh, processional to the crucifixion site was led by a complete Roman military guard, again, the centurion with his 100 legionnaires, and uh, they would not, they would always make sure they stayed till the person was dead. And the reason is, and then I don't know about in Jerusalem, but often other places, 
if someone escaped off the cross, which is hard to believe, but if they did, those Roman soldiers could be put to death. So it was very important that they completed the job. So uh, outside the city walls, there would be this permanent upright wooden stipes, it's called. And to, pro pro to prolong the crucifixion process, oftentimes they would build these little wood blocks into that upright uh, piece of wood to give them something to partially sit on, to give them a break from just hanging there. Here's just a picture of, uh, on the right, the, the titulus, and uh, down below in the right lower quadrant, it's talk, it just shows there the little differences in the type of crosses. And here on the left, it shows Jesus carrying that, that cross. The variation of crosses, as I mentioned, when the, the first recorded uh, uh, illustrations of crucifixion to come from way back when, and they were people just crucified on a tree. And then they went to an upright post, and then there eventually there were these cross bars that would come across. And you remember Peter was crucified upside, upside down, just as kind of a little side note. So here's Jesus in that uh, passageway leading outside of Jerusalem. Oftentimes they were taunted by the crowds uh, or those crying and if they were supportive of Jesus. And Jesus, you remember, collapses and can't carry that patibulum anymore. He, he, passes, or he drops it and he can't get up anymore. And then they pull this, and this was not that uncommon, they would pull someone out of the crowd and grab them to carry that patibulum to the crucifixion site. And it was Simon of Cyrene who was uh, visiting for the Passover uh, festival. Here again, just another picture of Jesus carrying the whole cross in the movie. And here's the painting. Here again, here's the legionnaire with his uh, stick pointing to Simon of Cyrene saying, hey, you, you carry it for him. So at the site of the execution, the hands would be nailed to the crossbar. And in a lot of old paintings, you see it going through the hand. In, in Hebrew, Hebrew literature, the hand includes the wrist. So um, if, if the nail was driven into the hand, it's very doubtful you couldn't hold the weight. And so it would just literally tear through. And so the Romans, again, knowing what they were doing, would, would put the nail through the wrist, uh, which still was part of the uh, hand. And they're usually a, a five to seven inch spike. And here's just showing going into the uh, uh, hand on the patibulum. The feet similarly would be nailed uh, to this little piece of wood you'll see here in a little bit. Uh, and when, that, when they do that and they're put in this position, there's this kind of natural flexion of the knees and some left lateral rotation, which is then hard for you to, to, to push yourself up. As you just, you're going to hear later, it's important for you to be able to breathe. You've got to push yourself up, and we're going to learn more about that in a little bit. So you can imagine with these nails, this nail driven into your feet, and then you have to push up and then pull like this so you can breathe, you can imagine the pain, the excruciating pain that someone would go through. Here's just uh, from the movie where uh, uh, the nail would go in, usually between the uh, second and third or first and second metatarsal bone of the, uh, of the foot. <clears throat> the titulus then would be attached to the cross above the head and here's the, the centurion doing that. And this is just a drawing from uh, 1490, or painting from 1492, illustrating basically the same thing. And here's the, uh, the uh, legionnaires raising the, the cross up with Jesus on it. And here is just a painting demonstrating that same thing. Uh, 
Oftentimes they'd be given a little drink, something to keep them alive, to make the last allow, to allow the crucifixion to last longer. Uh, and oftentimes it wasn't something you enjoyed, it was something you wouldn't want to drink. And so they would mix a little bit of wine with something like myrrh or gall, which is basically the gallbladder juice uh, of an animal. And, it, and uh, it would give them a little bit of analgesia, again, just to prolong the pain. And here's just from the movie illustrating that. And the Gospels talk about this as well. And I think Jesus uh, uh, refuses to take it. So often there'd be the crowd again taunting and jeering. I think the, there were people that said, if you truly are the Son of God, take yourself down from the cross. And oftentimes the soldiers would also be able to customarily divide up the victim's clothes or possessions, and that's exactly what the Bible describes. It's kind of just kind of, uh, it's interesting how the Gospels, the, each one doesn't tell the whole story, they tell part of the story. And it's kind of neat when you put it all together and then you look at the historical documents, it's all right there. Here's the three, uh, you don't see the fellow on the left very well, but here's the kind of what it might have looked like outside of Jerusalem on Golgotha. Here is a painting, interesting painting back from 586. It's amazing. Uh, on, the, uh, on your left, you can see off to the far left, that's, mother, that's his mother, has the kind of the halo, and then uh, Mary Magdalene next next to her. So the length of the uh, survival of the, uh, of, of, was usually three to four hours to three or four days. There were some recorded of someone lasting up to nine days. Can you imagine just hanging there? Uh, it just depended, a lot of it depended on the, 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 that precursor of the scourging, how badly they beat you up because there was a fair amount of blood loss with that. The soldiers could hasten the death by breaking the bones uh, the, the tib fib with these big wooden uh, uh, bars, which you're going to see in a, in a, in a, mit, a minute here. Um, it's called crucifracture is the word for it. And it would lead to this asphyxic death where the person could no longer rise up to, take, to uh, exhale and to breathe properly. They would just basically slump because they no longer had the ability to push up. Here's uh, just from the movie, uh, Jesus had already died, and uh, they went to the other two thieves and broke their legs to hasten their death. At the site of the crucifixion, the crucifixion, there were animals that would, would come to the area when they knew there was going to be something to eat or, or whatever, insects, birds of prey. Uh, sometimes if the, per the person was living two or three days, they would have a low cross so uh, uh, coyotes or other animals could get to the, uh, the body. Uh, but in this cir circumstance, with Roman law, the family could take down the body for burial after obtaining permission from the, the Roman judge or ruler. So the body was not released to the family until the soldiers were sure of death. And by custom, one of the soldiers would pierce the body with a spear or a lance, usually a five or six foot spear, through the, through the chest, actually go through the right chest, and I'll explain that in a little bit, just to make sure the person was dead. Because remember, they were on the hook if this guy doesn't die. And here, Jesus has died at this point, and uh, the soldier is uh, piercing his side. Here's just a painting of that same thing. So again, the Romans were not dumb. They knew in their anatomy, and they know to, to make sure the person was dead by perforating the le right lung and then traveling the spear through the heart into the left lung, both lungs would collapse, and the heart basically would just bleed out. So it just ensure that the death would be pretty much immediate at that point in time. So there's a lot of contributing causes of death, and no one knows really for sure what the exact cause was. 
Scourging served to weaken the, the condemned person. It would, if they bled a lot, they would get hypotensive. Their pressure would drop. They could go into shock. Um, they'd be thrown on the ground on their backs when they got to the crucifixion site. The wounds would open up again and further bleeding would occur. Um, and with each respiration, uh, as the person would move up and down, the, these wounds on the back would be rubbing up against this uh, wooden uh, stipes. So the wrist nails would support the weight. Uh, and again, uh, the artery and the, and the arteries, the radial and ulnar artery, are on either side of the wrist. So if, they, if the spike went through the artery, they would bleed quite a bit uh, and hasten the death. But they were smart enough to put the nail right through the wrist and right through the median nerve. Now, and everyone who has carpal tunnel knows what those feelings can be like. But if you can imagine a nail just crushing that nerve and uh, the pain that would occur from that uh, a nail disrupting that nerve altogether. Uh, this just is a drawing of, of where that spike would go. Again, this is a five to seven inch metal spike. The foot nails usually go through the second or third or first and second metatarsal, uh, 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 metatarsals, and then of course there's nerves that go right through that area as well, and those nerves would be damaged. Here just shows a drawing of that. So there, there's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of causes that contribute to the death. So one of the major things besides the pain and the bleeding and so forth is the marked inter interference with normal breathing. So the weight of the body, when your arms are up like this and, and pulled up, you're in a, your ribs are in a state of inhalation. And uh, so when you're breathing, you need to get, a, get rid of carbon dioxide. And how you do that is to exhale. The problem is to exhale, when you're hanging there like this, you need to push up and pull, and, and pull down here to, so you can exhale properly and adequately. And you can imagine the pain when you're pulling on these, these spikes and then pushing to raise yourself up here so you, can, so you can exhale and get rid of that carbon dioxide. That's why some people say his cause of death was asphyxia. He just literally died because of too much carbon dioxide. So, uh, and part of that CO2 retention is you get muscle spasms and contractions and so forth. Um, each respiration would become agonizing, more painful, and then eventually some people say they would just actually die from asphyxia. Shoulder dislocations were really common. Matter of fact, that, uh, that uh, actor in The Passion, he dislocated his shoulder during the process of being up on that cross. <clears throat> And this is a kind of a, a pathophysiological drawings of, of what happens and so forth in that, that way of uh, possibly dying, that mode of death. So the actual cause of death, uh, a lot of medical people say it's, it's probably multifactorial. We're never going to know. Uh, the most prominent theory is that asphyxic, asphyxic death, that it basically he just ran out of energy and couldn't raise himself up anymore. Uh, uh, so exhaustion, asphyxia is what it's called. Also, people, some people say, well, he just died of just blood loss, just continue with blood loss, just continue bleeding from all these wounds. Other factors, you know, he had, remember, he was, his last meal was Monday, Thursday that evening, so he hadn't had anything for at least 24 hours or more. Uh, some people say he may have had a cardiac arrhythmia, which is possible, although he's a pretty healthy guy. When you think about it, he's in his early 30s and very active. He walked everywhere he went. And uh, uh, congestive heart failure, that could have possibly been. It's usually an older person disease, but his heart was under considerable, considerable amount of stress. And we're going to see later why that congestive heart failure theory uh, does hold some uh, uh, credence. So Jesus spoke seven times from the cross. When you add on all four Gospels, it looks like he spoke about seven times. 
And when we speak, we speak in exhalation. Okay, when you think about that, we speak when we're exhaling. So he spoke seven times, but you've noticed every one of those, those things he said were in short utterances. They're very short. And the reason is because he, it was so painful, he had to get out of that position. So he would he'd be able, he'd pull himself up, have all that pain, would exhale, do his talking, and he just had to collapse again. So very short utterances each time. Uh, at 3 o'clock, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, bows his head, and dies, witnessed by soldiers and the onlookers. Uh, the Jews did not like to have the bodies on the cross after sunset, before the Passover, before the Sabbath, and so... Um, the family asked, actually it was not so much the family, it was, uh, I'm blanking out. Yeah, Joseph of Arathemia, and then uh, uh, Nicodemus, I think, was involved as well, and they asked for permission, which to me was a big deal to ask permission. But So the, the centurion went to Pilate, and he, sa and, and he says, this guy's dead. He said, well, are you sure he's dead? So they sent him back to do their job, and... Uh, uh, the soldiers pierced his right side, as they usually did, and there was a sudden gush of blood and water, as it described in the Bible, which is interesting. The water would be from the potential that he may have had some congestive heart failure going on because there'd be all this pulmonary fluid that had been accumulated in the lungs. So it would be water as well as blood gushing out of his chest. And later the body was taken down and, and put in the tomb. And this is just... Uh, a picture of his last words there. Just a couple paintings. <clears throat> he was being taken down. So Jesus' death occurred about six hours from about nine o'clock to three o'clock in the after nine o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon. The death surprised even Pontius Pilate. The controversy from physicians, uh, researchers, did, could he have had a cardiac rupture or cardiopulmonary uh, uh, failure? And, uh, or uh, what is a, could have been a cardiac arrhythmia? Could have been just the severity of the scourging that caused the death at the time it did? I almost kind of think it was just God taking him home at 3 o'clock just to be symbolic of the fact that that's when the sacrificial lime, lamb would be sacrificed and killed the day before Passover. So nonetheless, whatever caused the death, this happened at that point in time. And here he's being cared for. So Jesus dies. As you call in the gospel, the, the veil of the temple was torn in two, indicating kind of an end to the earthly ceremonial system, all those countless animal sacrifices from all those long centuries uh, from Adam and Eve onward now found the complete fulfillment of Jesus. So here in human flesh, the Lord took upon, him, took, took upon himself the sins of the world in order that every human being, every human being, uh, no matter how sinful, could find forgiveness, healing, and the promise of eternal life. So that new covenant that was initiated on Monday, Thursday, it was announced at the Last Supper and ratified on Good Friday. It is so well stated by R.C. Sproul. And of course, then, three days later, um, it's interesting now, they said, well, three days later, wait a second, this was Friday and then it was Sunday. Well, in the Jewish way of thinking, you always count the first day you always count from, oh, so you count Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So each day is counted as a pertinent day. And then this is a, a doubting Thomas. Uh, when Jesus occurs to the disciples a second time, he's, a bit, he's, he's able to see the, uh, the wounds. Uh, Conrad Adenauer, he was the first chancellor post-World uh, War II Germany. He said, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is probably the most important thing in the world. Whereas if he is alive, then there is hope for all of us, for the world. And we come to Easter. Interesting facts. Four years after the crucifixion, Caiaphas, who's the high priest, was deposed as well as Pilate at the same time. 
And in 337 A.D., Constantine the Great outlaws crucifixion in honor of Christ. Uh, this was just kind of an interesting thing. John Corson, who's a pastor out in Oregon, um, uh, talks of Jesus bleeding from seven different sites and how he thought, how, why he thought that was significant is because of the fact that the high priest, when the lamb was sacrificed, the blood would be sprinkled seven times in the, on the altar, seven times. And the number seven is a, is a number in the Jewish faith of, of perfection, of cleansing and completion. And Jesus, again, bleeding from the head, from the uh, uh, scourging as well as the uh, crown, from both hands, both feet, uh, his heart, and then from his uh, back. So that's it. So (laughs) questions. It's a lot to unload. Yes, any questions? And so then those at home will get you on the mic here. Josiah. Yeah. I'm just curious, were children or young, like just of any age, teenagers, or any, was there any, rec- any recordings of them being crucified back then? Did Romans crucify them? That's, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but there's records of upwards of up to 2,000 people being crucified about the same time, hung up on trees outside of a city that the Romans had uh, um, uh, had interaction with, and, and 